Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shanice Chris, and I'm a doctoral student in the Department of Society, Human Development, and Health. I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you today on behalf of the Division of Policy Translation and Leadership Development. I have the honor of introducing our decision-making Voices from the Field speaker, Ms. Sheila Burke. Today, Ms. Burke will be giving us insight on pushing healthcare decisions through the U.S. Congress, and I know that she has such a wealth of experience. Ms. Burke was Chief of Staff to Senator Bob Dole from 1986 to 1996, while he was Minority, then Majority Leader. In 1995, she was elected to Secretary of Senate, which is the Chief Administrator Office, office in the United States Senate. She started as a member of the staff of the Senate Finance Committee in 1978 and was, was responsible for legislation relating to Medicare, Medicaid, and other health-related programs. She served as a member of the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission and was a member of the Board of Trustees of the Kaiser Family Foundation, which included serving as chair of the board. She was elected to the membership of the Institute of Medicine, National Academy of Sciences, and the National Academy of Public Administration. Ms. Burke has worked at the Smithsonian Institution, which is the world's largest museum and research complex, as Under Secretary for American Museums and National Programs, and then served as Deputy Secretary and Chief Operating Officer. In addition, Ms. Burke was Executive Dean and Lecturer in Public Policy at the John F. K. Kennedy School of Government right here at Harvard University, and is currently a member of faculty there and a faculty research fellow at the Malcolm Weiner Center for Social Policy. She earned a master's degree in public administration from Harvard University and a bachelor's degree in nursing from the University of San Francisco. There are countless other accolades that we could talk about with Ms. Burke, but I'm sure they were all eager to hear from her. So please join me in welcoming Ms. Sheila Burke. Uh, Sheila, thank you for joining us. Just to uh, refresh everybody, this series is aimed at giving you a chance to understand when you are in a leadership position, the kinds of issues and choices people make. So it's very aimed at not convincing you of what the best public policy, it's really thinking about how people who make the critical decisions examine it. Uh, and so uh, for those of us who've had a chance to follow Sheila's career, it has been in the middle of decisions that affected U.S. health policy for just decades and shaped a lot of the outcomes. So Sheila, I welcome you here and it's once again a privilege to appear on any panel with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is a, uh, it is a treat for me to be with all of you today uh, and to be with my friend Bob Blendon. Uh, I have had the opportunity over a number of years too many to count, uh, of working with Bob and seeing the extraordinary contribution his work has uh, made to our deliberations with respect to health policy. Uh, if there is anyone who understands the sort of role that public opinion plays, uh, an understanding of that, uh, the role of consensus, uh, it is Bob. So it is a, a great pleasure to be here and to be here with all of you. I am, as asked, uh, going to talk a little bit about decision making. Uh, I'm going to talk about it in the context of the Congress uh, and how they go about making decisions. Uh, I'm going to do it in the context of sort of my own experience, um, having worked in the Senate for 20 years, uh, and reflect a little bit about, I think, some of the challenges that they face today. Uh, I will also be more than happy uh, and anxious to answer any specific questions that you have about any specific pieces of legislation. Uh, or anything that's occurring today or those things that we've done in the past. Uh, as was noted, I had the opportunity to serve as a chief of staff to a Senate majority leader and a minority leader. A lot easier on the majority side than on the uh, <laughs> minority side. Uh, and my experience was in its entirety in the Senate. And, and I will tell you at the outset that there is a real difference between the two bodies. We are a bicameral legislature in the House and the Senate. Uh, my experience is largely the Senate, but hopefully these reflections will give you a sense of the deliberations of both bodies. But they, I will underscore, are radically different in many respects, and I'm happy to talk about that as well. But I'd like to start, if I might, um, just close your eyes for a moment and imagine that you're back in 1856. Uh, the Senate and the House have been in operation to, uh, really since the late 1700s. 
1789 when they first met. Uh, and, you know, they've had periods of time where the deliberations were more thoughtful, perhaps, uh, than at other times, and there was more attempt at consensus building. But at this particular moment in time, uh, there is a great deal of controversy and angst between uh, the two bodies, between the House and the Senate, and between uh, those uh, who are in a particular position with respect to the issues that are going to be confronted in the Civil War. But as you imagine, at this point in time, Congressman Brooks, uh, who was a member from uh, South Carolina, uh, confronted your own senator, Senator Charles Sumner, uh, on the floor and proceeded to beat him senseless with a cane. Uh, the congressman's colleagues held off uh, Mr. Sumner's supporters with a pistol uh, to prevent them from intervening in the midst of this uh, assault, which left him essentially in a terrible position for a number of months and his inability to go back to his job in the Senate. Uh, it gives you a little taste of the history between the two bodies. Uh, things today are not quite as dramatic, uh, I'm grateful to say, but nonetheless, uh, you continue to see real differences between the two bodies on particular positions, and you see it even today in terms of some of the deliberations that are occurring today. Uh, I think we are, in fact, in somewhat troubling times uh, with respect to the legislature and the deliberations that we count on as a nation for them to make uh, and to process a great deal of information in a whole series of decisions about everything that uh, we, in fact, are involved in. I thought about this early in my career when I was in practice as a nurse, and it became very evident to me. I had very little knowledge of the Congress and, frankly, didn't care much about what occurred in Washington or in a state capital in California, when it became apparent to me that where I practiced, uh, what it is I was permitted to do, the patients I was permitted to care for, who financed those services, uh, and the nature of the, the care that was being given was a function in many instances uh, of what occurred in the legislative process and in the legislative body. So if I leave you with no other message today, it will be that you ought to pay very close attention uh, to those that are making these decisions and the method by which they make the decisions and the information upon which those decisions are based because they in fact have an enormous impact uh, on all of us. I uh, have vivid memories of attending a number of um, town hall meetings uh, with Senator Dole in the state of Kansas. Now, as you can imagine, as someone born and raised in California, uh, I was not terribly familiar with um, a rural community and the challenges of a rural community. Uh, but I can remember vividly going to town hall meetings with Dole and having people raise their hand and vociferously argue to get the government out of their business and out of their, uh, their care. Not infrequently, it was somebody who was in their late 60s who was dependent upon Medicare and dependent upon Social Security uh, and a variety of other um, programs, whether they arrived at the meeting on an interstate highway system, uh, whether they essentially were a recipient in Kansas, not unusually, of a farm support uh, that supported the business that they did. Um, there was very little about their lives that didn't have some decision having been made that had an impact on them. So just keep that in mind. But I am troubled because I think that the deliberative process uh, is in fact at risk today. Um, that both parties are increasingly polarized, uh, largely focused specifically on the point of view of a particular party. There are fewer opportunities for deliberations, fewer opportunities for consensus building. Uh, less interest in the negotiations that would normally occur that would arrive at a consensus that would allow a piece of legislation to go forward. Uh, I can think of numerous instances in the past that we can certainly talk about. Social Security among them in the 83 Act when essentially uh, we saved Social Security from what appeared to be uh, a quick spiraling out of control and uh, a lack of funding necessary for the program uh, when essentially Bob Dole and Pat Moynihan approached one another on the Senate floor having seen the failure of the Greenspan Commission to essentially come up with a solution and essentially said we can't let this happen. 
we have to, in fact, find a way to reach consensus between the two sides. There are a variety of instances and examples that we can think of where that, in fact, has occurred. Um, but essentially what you're happening today is fewer and fewer of those opportunities exist. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about where those opportunities can exist and where they can play out uh, and what is beginning to inhibit those opportunities today. Uh, but in thinking about the decision making, think that members, in fact, have a variety of roles and a variety of responsibilities. Um, first of all, they are responsible to their constituents. So when you think about the basis upon which people make decisions, very often the first place they go is to their own constituents, the people that sent them there, the particular issues that they care about because of the nature of their constituency. Uh, I'll give you another example. Uh, some of you may have heard when I first went to work for Senator Dole, uh, I, again, had very little experience with a rural community and the r needs of rural uh, Americans, uh, particularly with respect to their health care services, having practiced in Berkeley. Uh, I was hardly familiar with sort of the small institution. Bob Dole told me to call Art Glenn. He was his mother's optometrist in Russell, Kansas. Uh, not unusual, because the first place that people go is to the people that sent them there and their own reality. And so their first responsibility is essentially to their constituency and essentially the politics of that local constituency. Uh, in the Senate, they tend to be much more general in terms of their interests and their knowledge, in part because they have a much broader array of issues to deal with. Dole being an example of someone who had to care about the agricultural community because of its dependence uh, as an income source in the state of Kansas, but he also had the small aircraft manufacturing capital, was in Wichita. He also had bases, Leavenworth being a good example, in addition to prisons. Um, he had bases that he essentially had to be concerned about the number of veterans, the number of active duty of military. Um, and so each senator approaches the issues that confront them with a perspective of what are the interests in my own state. And their first decision point is one that how will it, in fact, how will it affect the people at home. Um, uh, on the House side, they tend to be narrower because they tend to have a smaller base upon which that they are interested in being concerned. You know, it is the congressman from Wichita who was Dan Glickman at one point in time, who went on to be a terrific Secretary of Agriculture. Uh, and then went on to run the Motion Picture Association. <laughs> so they go on to lots of different interests. Uh, but essentially his particular interest was agriculture, but it was always very specifically the sort of uh, business of small aircraft manufacturing. Every single member, every single senator and House member has that same reality. And if they're smart, they'll realize the first decision has to be one that takes that into consideration because essentially they want to come back. Uh, and so satisfying their constituencies, whether it's in potholes or social security checks, or in those issues that are specific to their economic interests, it is the most important responsibility. Their second uh, is they will develop individually an area of expertise. And a member will have made that decision in part based on their local constituency, uh, but also on the opportunities and their particular interests. For example, uh, there are members who, uh, as you might imagine, from the state of North Carolina, have a unique interest in the banking industry because of the interest and investment in banking in North Carolina. The same would be true in New York. And so members will tend to gravitate towards those areas where they have a constituent interest, where a development of an expertise is particularly valuable to them. So those issues will also bear on their decision making. What will it do in terms of that interest? What will it do in terms of the interests that come before the Senate Finance Committee, for example, which is everything from all the tax laws to all the trade laws to Medicare to Medicaid to a whole variety of things, Social Security. So the member will also have those interests in particular um, in mind as they make their decisions. And then, of course, there are the leadership decisions. That is, if they are a member of the leadership, uh, in their own party, in either, either body. They have broader responsibilities to think of for their members, for their particular uh, interests. And if you are in the minority, then you're very interested in making sure that your point of view is held and y your colleagues are well represented. If you're in the majority, of course, you set the agenda. So each of those opportunities present a decision making for a member. The first decision is how do they spend their time? What are their particular interests? 
what will they be particularly committed to becoming involved in, uh, in terms of their constituents, and what is it their constituents care about. There are also multiple points in the decision-making process uh, where they have an opportunity to essentially be heard. So what has occurred uh, in recent years are a variety of things. One, you've tended to have members who essentially uh, have constituent interests, but are also increasingly knowledgeable and sensitive to their party interests. So that you've seen an increased polarization in both the House and the Senate, and very little in terms of the middle. Uh, if you look at sort of the history of both bodies, you'll see if you look at what the distribution looks like that the public tends to poll in the middle. Bob knows this better than anyone. If you ask them sort of their positions on issues, they tend to have this sort of centrist, you know, in that sort of middle of the, these sort of two um, sort of groups. And historically, you saw that members, there were a few on both ends, but there were a large majority of them that sort of leaned towards the middle and essentially represented that sort of middle and represented increasingly the public as well as their own constituents. What you see today are a far greater number of members who identify themselves on the extremes on both sides and very little with respect to the middle. So that you find increasingly challenges in making decisions that are broadly representative. You have less willingness to essentially compromise to come to the middle one, because of your party and the positioning of your party, also increasingly because of what you're hearing in many instances from your constituents. But if we talk about and think about where decisions get made and why things have become more complicated, um, they are made in the course of introducing legislation, identifying what a problem might be and wanting to intervene in that problem. And so you'll find members that make decisions on what they will co-sponsor, for example. You have the opportunity in the course of a committee looking at a piece of legislation and in the normal course would have an opportunity to change that legislation in committee, to hold hearings on that legislation, to seek out compromise on those particular measures. You have a further opportunity when you go to the floor of the House or the Senate and you have the opportunity to amend, to speak on a particular issue, to build coalitions around trying to build consensus. Uh, Social Security was a good example of that. There are others. The Welfare Reform Bill, for example, this uh, President Clinton essentially supported and endorsed during the course of 96, which was quite unusual, but essentially it had a process that allowed those negotiations to occur. You then essentially have the historical differences between the House and Senate that come together in a conference, where the two bodies come together and there's an opportunity to resolve the differences between the two bodies that have arisen and essentially build a consensus that then goes to the president for signature. Well, what we've seen beginning to occur is there are fewer opportunities at the committee level where the committees in the last go-round during the course of the health care legislation essentially were sidetracked and essentially were not in the business of really doing the kind of preparation, analysis, and consensus building that would have led to a consensus product. Uh, you saw the leadership, particularly in the House, uh, take on essentially the responsibility of establishing the principal positions and essentially driving the committee process. In the Senate, you had a deliberation in the Senate Finance Committee with Senator Baucus and Senator Grassley, who over a long period of time did what would traditionally occur, which is a process of negotiation. But at the end of the day, the committee process was limited. The amendment process was limited. There were essentially no real opportunities on the Senate floor. And then essentially the decision was made because of the timing, because of the Brown uh, election, to essentially have the House simply accept the Senate bill. And so all of the opportunities that would normally occur for consensus, for negotiation, essentially disappeared in that process. And as a result, you ended up with a piece of legislation for a variety of reasons that is more partisan in nature than had historically been the case with many other pieces of legislation. Even in the original passage of Medicare and Medicaid, while there was originally tremendous opposition, particularly from organized medicine and from a number of members, including Bob Dole, the final bill received uh, essentially the majority of support. Uh, but increasingly what you're finding, because of the polarization, the desire to have supermajority requirements in the Senate, 
where you have to have 60 votes to pass anything, essentially because of the threat of a filibuster, which has become more of a growth industry. Uh, in history, you saw very little in the way of a filibuster occur. There were examples during the civil rights negotiations. Of course, one of the most well-known was um, Strom Thurmond, uh, who stood on the floor for something in excess of 23 hours and spoke out. Uh, but you saw fewer and fewer of those occur over time. Uh, again, as members increasingly sought a consensus. And in the Senate, the bulk of the work is essentially done by consent, where members agree in advance and essentially you very easily pass things through after some opportunity for deliberation. Uh, you now see the threat of a filibuster or the reality of the beginning of a filibuster has altered essentially the willingness to open legislation up for amendment the unwillingness to essentially simply take a bill to the floor and allow the normal course of debate to occur and the normal course of amendment to occur. Essentially, there's a very quick decision to limit amendments. That's much more traditional in the House than it is in the Senate, where the House rules and the majority in the House has traditionally held a much stronger position, and the majority is in a much stronger position than traditionally in the Senate, where a great deal was done by consensus and by consent. Bob Dole would go and meet with Bob Byrd, who was the minority leader, majority leader, uh, during his early days. Or he would sit down with George Mitchell, again, in a, uh, an opportunity to essentially build consensus. Uh, the catastrophic legislation that was passed in the, uh, in the 80s that was reversed and repealed within 18 months, which is almost unheard of, was an effort made by Dole and Mitchell to essentially pursue this legislation that was essentially reversed as the result of the effort of one member, that was John McCain, very aggressively on the basis of his constituents who were very much opposed to essentially the premium structure. So the process essentially uh, is one that has begun to change, where there are fewer of those opportunities. Bill Frist reached out when he was leader in a number of cases to Daschle. Uh, there were instances where those conversations occurred, but what was interesting to observe in the course of this last debate on the budget uh, was you saw no presence of uh, Mitch McConnell in these discussions. It was largely taken up in terms of on the House side uh, in that caucus and with John Boehner, uh, but Nancy Pelosi wasn't evident in sort of those discussions either. So the whole power structure has changed, and as a result, the decision-making process has changed. But the fundamentals are still there, that members tend to look at their constituent interests, and I'll give you a specific example. Um, we had um, an opportunity during the course um, of a deliberation on a number of Medicare measures uh, to consider an issue that was brought to our attention by one of our constituents. Uh, and it, what it shows is that members first listen to what they're hearing from home. This was a particular issue having to do with a young man who was a hemophiliac uh, and had a particular issue around the self-administration of a, a particular clotting factor. Uh, the end result was we passed legislation and incorporated it into the Medicare law. But that came to us because of a constituent. Uh, those still occur. You still find members responding first to the issues that are raised at home and then seeking out from their colleagues the opportunity to build a consensus. Very often members will first consider, is it an issue for me at home? If it isn't an issue for me at home, is it a political issue? Or can I negotiate out a vote? Can I negotiate with a colleague who needs me on this vote in turn, I will have the opportunity to negotiate with that colleague on securing a vote on something else. So those opportunities still exist. Members still look first. But increasingly what you're seeing is more party line voting. If you look at the statistics in the Congresses over the last 15, 20 years, there is a sizable increase in the number of times that they simply vote party and simply position themselves as party. You have far fewer of those people that are crossing the line. In the last election, you saw a decline in the number of the blue dog Democrats on the House side who were viewed as centrist or more conservative. Uh, you saw a decline in the number of self-described centrists in the Senate uh, by retirement through a variety of means. So that you essentially have the message being sent. A, a good example is Bob Bennett's loss in the Senate. You now have Orrin Hatch, who is his colleague from Utah, who is up for re-election next time, who is also concerned about whether he is going to be viewed as or positioned as in opposition to his party, in opposition to the constituents at home. And so first decision is, where are you from? What do you care about? Second decision is, what is this going to do in terms of my broader interests and expertise? Third is, what is it going to do in terms of party? And it's particularly challenging if your party also holds the White House. 
that also has to be a factor in terms of your decision making. So it has become increasingly difficult. The opportunities are fewer. Members tend to spend fewer hours with one another. There is a much more constrained time frame. Uh, members used to, in the old days, uh, be, on the, be in the Senate, have weekends in town. Their families would hear, be here, so they would have an opportunity to get to know one another. They would travel on overseas trips together. It would give them an opportunity both across the aisle. I'll never forget taking a Codell to the Far East with Pat Moynihan. Uh, Dole was leading the Codell, and we had a number of members on the Codell. Moynihan was among them. Uh, and the opportunity it gave for the members to talk with one another in a setting where there was no conflict, where they could share with each other the knowledge that they had, uh, I think there is less opportunity for that to occur, and therefore tensions tend to rise when you really don't know the person uh, across the aisle. I think fewer opportunities to go into the corners and talk with each other. Um, I had a colleague um, for many years uh, on the House side uh, who worked for Henry Waxman. And during the course of the 80s, when we were doing a number of things in the Medicaid program, uh, we would very quietly talk with one another. Without attribution, we didn't leave one another's names when we left messages uh, for each other in each other's offices. Um, but it allowed us to have a conversation behind the door. During the course of the Clinton health care reform, um, Lawrence O'Donnell, uh, was working for Pat Moynihan at the time. Pat was the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee. Lawrence contacted me offline and said, you know, Moynihan wants to see if he can test out some possible solutions with Dole without attribution just behind the scenes. Let's see if we can't build some kind of consensus. There was a mainstream coalition during the course of the Clinton debate, which was made up of people like Bob Carey and John Chafee and Dave Durenberger and Jack Danforth, all of whom were sort of on both sides of the aisle, viewed as centrist. You now have the gang of six who are made up of three, how, three Dems, three Republicans in the Senate who are attempting to build, again, a middle around the deficit uh, <coughs> battles uh, led by Mark Warner of Virginia. So there are, it, it, there are hopeful signs that there are still a recognition that you have to build from the middle to essentially try to bring people together. Um, so that there, you know, there is some hope going forward, but at least sort of the underlying challenges that we face, I think, um, make it very difficult to imagine going forward with the same kind of thoughtful deliberations that I think we've seen in the past. So let me uh, So stop we're going to open it up briefly. in a second to you, but first Bob gets a question. And so in the back of my mind, uh, because the position that uh, Sheila holds are positions that many of our students someday would hope to hold. So in this very difficult environment, I'm trying to think about if someone took over as the new staff director for the majority leader and they called you and said, this is a really tough environment. Sheila, give me some advice. How do I function in this environment? It's not ideal, but how do I function in this? And staff are not members, so we're mm -hmm. at more risk about things happening to us, what advice could you give them? Uh, you know, the first, um, the first question is, what will your boss permit you to do? Um, I uh, essentially had a boss who could be bitterly partisan. You know, we, there were Darth Vader days, uh, <laughs> as we call them, when the dark side would arrive, sort of Skippy the evil twin would come into the office. <laughs> so, um, but he was fundamentally somebody who uh, viewed the legislative process and the process of negotiation at the heart of what it is that they were being called on to do. And so his view was it was positive that we reached out to others and sought out opportunities for, uh, for consensus. Um, I developed a relationship when um, George Mitchell was the Democratic leader and Dole was the um, uh, Republican leader. Uh, where George Mitchell's chief of staff, who was also a woman, which was unusual at the time, we were the first women to hold these jobs, um, we essentially would have a conversation with one another. So our bosses were never surprised. Um, we would essentially reach out quietly to one another. Uh, again, similar to the Moynihan conversations, similar to the Waxman conversations, uh, I would strongly encourage, unless essentially your boss sends a very different signal, that you want to have quietly, you know, developed relationships across the aisle, and frankly, among your own colleagues. Um, Dole was viewed um, by some of the conservatives um, with some suspicion. 
uh, as uh, at one point was called the tax collector for the welfare state because of many of the tax reforms that we were involved in the 80s and 90s. But it, you know, Dole's view was there was never an op there was never a case where you couldn't attempt to build a relationship with someone that you could depend on going forward. Uh, and so, uh, again, an attempt to build coalitions, an attempt to build relationships with people who you might not agree with on all issues, uh, but who might be, in fact, important to you in building a coalition going forward. So my first would be, you know, be open to the people with whom you're working on both sides of the aisle and within your own caucus. Um, there's very little that's black and white in the Senate. Uh, and in the House, and so there rarely are there circumstances where you absolutely just cannot talk with someone, and that was certainly the message I was always given by Dole. Let's open this up uh, widely, uh, so Sheila gets to know you, uh, tell us who you are, what program you're in, and uh, ask her a question, and I'd like to cover as many people as we can in the remainder of the time. Peregrine Dalziel, I'm an MPH student in the policy and management track. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering, you alluded to a number of times that there was less time for consensus building, less mm -hmm. opportunity, mm -hmm. not so many friendly overseas trips, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. what, why is that? I was just not clear as to why you think that's happening. You know, I think there are a variety of things that have changed the culture of the institution. Uh, the members have less tolerance um, for um, being here. There's a great desire to spend more time at home. Um, they are essentially in a campaign mode now almost full time uh, with a sort of introduction of uh, sort of 24 hour news cycle, uh, the concern that many constituents had that they, you know, they send them to Washington and they never come home. And so increasingly you have members that essentially, you know, want to work Tuesday to, you know, Thursday or work in a tighter time frame and then essentially go home and spend time with their constituents. That's not necessarily a bad thing. But it does change the sort of nature of the relationship. A uh, fewer of them bring families. Uh, you hear stories of a number of members that will essentially live together, uh, you know, rent an apartment or rent a house, and essentially live together, and then spend all their um, free time at home with their families. You know, historically, you had families that were there, you know, wives that get to know one another, or husbands that get to know one another, uh, children. So there was more of a social environment in which the full family could fully participate. Um, part of it is just the nature of things are moving much more quickly, and so there's less time. And there's this desire, um, essentially, to get business done, but because it has become so difficult to build consensus around the big issues, the normal routine kinds of things, you know, sort of all the oversight, all the sort of passage of things that aren't necessarily controversial, have been somewhat impaired. And so you don't have as much give and take in the context of building coalitions around other kinds of issues where there might not be the kind of stress that you see on the sort of big, you know, sort of whether it's the continuing resolution or the budget resolution or the debt limit or health care reform. I mean, if you think of what occurred in the last, you know, year or two, um, you know, you, there are sort of these big things that have led to a lot of partisan uh, battles. And you hear about fewer of the things where, in fact, they've been able to build consensus. So I think it's a whole variety of things that contribute to that, frankly. Hi, I'm Anshu Abbott, and I am an MPH student in health policy. Um, I have a question a little bit to do with what you were saying, how the constituents, to, uh, I'm sorry, the legislators are really trying to represent the interest of their constituents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But how do special interests play a role in their decision making? Because it doesn't seem, and it seems like the process be has become less transparent than it was even before, and that wasn't very transparent. So how does that affect decision making, and how do you, when you're working with a legislator, factor that into how you try to influence them? You know, one man's <coughs> stakeholder is another man's special interest. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, you know. It is a process where uh, the gathering of information uh, from a variety of sources is an important part of the process. Uh, and special interests are you know, viewed in a pejorative way, but in many cases are simply people that represent a constituency who are trying to present information. Uh, a member's responsibility, and frankly the staff's responsibility, is to navigate through that. And I think the best staff are those that present both sides of every argument. 
so that a member essentially is fully informed of what the pros and cons are, what the issues are, and how essentially um, to make that decision. Because at the end of the day, it's the member's decision. Um, I can recall a circumstance where um, we were debating or about to debate fetal tissue research. And uh, given um, Dole's historical position with respect to reproductive rights, the obvious presumption was that he would, you know, essentially take a position in opposition because that was largely where that constituency was. And I felt it was responsible, uh, it was my responsibility to make sure that he understood both sides of the arguments, that he knew what people were saying on both sides. Now, you could argue that there were special interests involved uh, in that instance, uh, folks involved in Parkinson's, you know, which was viewed as a good thing, good special interests as compared to a negative. But nonetheless, the responsibility of a member and of a staff is to know both sides of those issues. So special interests play a role in a variety of ways. In some cases, it's an information gathering role. In some cases, they represent a particular constituency. They also may be financially invested in supporting a member. And that issue has essentially uh, been very difficult around the whole campaign finance issue and who contributes and what the rules are and, and whether or not that drives a decision that's made by a member. Um, one could argue that the fact that there were agricultural interests that supported Dole uh, suggested that it was a decision made driven by money. I would argue that it was a decision made because of his constituent interests, because he had folks in the state of Kansas who were dependent upon those interests economically. Now, are there abuses? Absolutely. Um, but I am not willing to say that all sort of institutional sort of structures that permit that input from a variety of sources is a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. I think the bad thing is when you don't take advantage of it and don't essentially negotiate through the truth and the accurate information and then allow the member to make the decision. Because at the end of the day, it's their decision, not a staff's. Uh, and you know, some are more dependent than others. It has become increasingly complex. Uh, and one of the challenges members face, I think, is in the complexity of the issues that they're confronting. Uh, the number of issues that they're confronting, they can only be experts in a limited number of things. So they tend to depend on their colleagues who've developed a particular expertise, or they depend on people that they've trusted in the, uh, in the community to essentially provide information. Art Glenn uh, in Russell, Kansas, who provided me information, or you know the Kansas Hospital Association. There was a fellow, Don Wilson, who was uh, just a spectacular, long-serving director um, who, you know, would tell me the truth. Now, I had to balance that against a variety of other issues, um, but you tend to develop those relationships uh, and you know who you can depend on. The mistake is in either misleading a member, not telling them who's going to be on the other side of it, uh, and not being sensitive to what their constituents care about. Hi, thank you for coming today. Um, my name is Shivitha Huli. I'm a pediatrician and um, an MPH candidate in global health and development, not health policy. Um, but prior to coming here, I had been involved quite a bit in advocacy initiatives, working with members of Congress and the Senate, um, and basically trying to use my expertise to help, mm -hmm. help influence their de decisions. Um, and it was from that that I actually became very disillusioned with um, our government. Um, a couple of things that occurred was um, a Congress member telling me why should Congress care about doctors when doctors weren't there when campaign contributions are being mm -hmm. solicited. Mm -hmm. Or um, a senator once saying that although they did agree with a certain way in a vote, um, they knew that they wouldn't get elected if they voted that way. Mm -hmm. And when she lost her election, that was one of the votes that was cited as a major reason. Mm -hmm. um, and so I hope that many of us end up going and trying to advocate on behalf of these issues that we care about. But what kinds of suggestions do you have for people like us that are maybe um, have some sort of expertise or mm -hmm. trying to influence people that are having to make very complex decisions that mm -hmm. often are very difficult to explain to lay public? Um, and how can we help them make those types of decisions? I mean, it's unfortunate that you had those two experiences because I could, you know, list 20 of experiences where that was not the case, where the member essentially voted uh, their conscience or voted their constituent interest. Um, you know, the first thing, um, and I say this routinely to people who are involved, particularly in health policy, is that we have a tendency to speak in acronyms. 
uh, we have a tendency to talk with one another or talk with others in terms we use with one another. And the most difficult thing for a member is to understand some of these complex issues. Um, it, it, helping them understand the sort of human face, the human direct intervention and the impact on an individual uh, is sometimes the most useful thing to do. Um, to find someone in their own community for whom the issue is important. Uh, there's a story that I often tell which has the benefit of being true. Um, <laughs> we were, uh, this was many years ago, um, uh, the Senate was debating um, cafe standards uh, which had to do with the essentially uh, size of the gas tank and the, the issues that were being driven in terms of Detroit and the decisions they had to make in terms of car design. And a particular <coughs> um, individual was trying to see a member and for a whole variety of reasons the member wasn't able to schedule the, the meeting uh, until the local car dealer from this particular state called to ask to see the member. The member said absolutely. Uh, car dealers were, a, were a, a powerful force and a very outspoken force for a particular community interest. Uh, and the member came out of uh, hearing and there was the <laughs> car dealership and he said, you know, gosh, Joe, why are you here? Well, Senator, you know, this issue's coming up. We're very concerned about it. And let me introduce you to Lee Iacocca, who at the time was the head of Chrysler. Uh, and the, the moral of that story is you want to connect to the things that people care about and the things that take place at home um, and examples from home if you possibly can. Uh, you also have to remember that, that you all probably know more than a member will know about a particular issue. And so you need to help them get the information that they need. You need to work with the staff. Uh, unless you have a personal relationship with a member, the best place to p start is with the staff and provide information to the staff in a form that is useful to them and understandable and never, ever, ever fail to mention who's going to be opposed. Uh, I'll never forget an instance where I uh, provided information to Senator Dole for a particular vote. He took the vote only to discover after the fact that he was in opposition to his colleague and close friend Nancy Kassebaum, who was the junior member from Kansas. Uh, and it was like, you know, what were you thinking? You know, why didn't you let me know that Nancy was concerned about this? And so you want to have full information. You want to tell them the up, the down, and the sideways, and who's going to be opposed. Uh, and you want to get in with a constituent interest and a particular interest for them, if you possibly can, connect it to their own experiences. Each of these members comes with a knowledge, comes with an experience. Uh, they are, on average, uh, better educated than the rest of the country. They tend to be uh, mostly college uh, degrees, in, in many cases, graduate degrees. Uh, there are fewer lawyers than there used to be, fewer than 50 percent are lawyers now, but these are people that come from lots of different backgrounds with lots of different expertise. In some ways I benefited from the fact that Dole spent three years in a hospital, uh, essentially following the war, and so he had a real sense of who cared for whom and what the circumstances were. Uh, and each member brings that. You know, they, uh, I, you know, it was not unusual for someone to say, oh, my mother was a nurse or my sister was a nurse. So you want to connect to what they know and the things they care about. <coughs> My name is Susanna Ramirez, and I'm an MPH student and a postdoc fellow at the National Cancer Institute. Um, I'd like to very respectfully sort of push back on mm -hmm. your um, notion of the constituent interest, mm -hmm. because I feel like um, it's, a, it's really very narrowly defined. It's those constituents who support me or who I can get to support me, mm -hmm. and it's also those who are loud and the squeaky wheels. Um, and I think part of the problem today is that the squeaky wheels are really not... Um, <coughs> good people in the sense that they're not looking out for the broader uh, goal of society. Mm -hmm. So I guess that my question is, I understand that they need to get reelected, mm -hmm. and those are the people who are making and shaping public opinion mm -hmm. that will get them reelected. Mm -hmm. But um, if we're a little bit idealistic still in that mm -hmm. we, we would like to protect all of society and not those who can, not just those who can afford to talk. Mm -hmm. And I'm not just talking about special interests, mm -hmm. but those who have the education and the resources mm -hmm. um, to talk and get the attention. H how do we how do we address that? As for our conversation? Well, I I, um, I think you raise a very good point. Um, there is no question that the method of financing campaigns in this country has had an impact 
uh, and certainly on people's perceptions of how information is transferred and who people listen to. Uh, I fundamentally still believe, however, that members go home and they listen. Uh, I think we saw in the course of um, uh, this last debate on health care reform um, that members went home <coughs> to town hall meetings, uh, just as Dole has did and as every other member I know has done historically, uh, to go home to town hall meetings and listen to those conversations. And they are fairly unfettered. I mean, they're fairly open in terms of the conversation. Members will tend to pay attention to sort of economic interests at home, uh, which again can be perceived as a narrow special interest by some, but may have a huge impact on a particular community <coughs> uh, in terms of their support. I think building coalitions is very important. Uh, you will find that you will um, sometimes see odd bedfellows sort of forming coalitions, uh, particularly to represent those who are less able to do so because of their limitations in terms of resources or access. Um, you know, these are issues around the homeless, issues in many cases around community health centers, the development of public health infrastructure, things of that nature, where the, the uh, goal is really to find someone else with whom you can partner who can also help articulate the message. Uh, there were uh, times when the AMA and the AARP, for example, would come together. So you want to look for coalitions, you want to look for the opportunity to partner with others. Uh, if you feel that you are a particularly disadvantaged group and are less likely to be heard from, uh, you want to find a champion. You know, who is it that's most concerned about your issue? With whom can you talk? Whose staff can you talk with? Who is prepared to represent that issue uh, to their colleagues? Because in many cases, a member won't necessarily have a position opposed, but won't have a particular need to be invested in your particular issue. Um, you know, a good example of a sort of a set of odd circumstances and odd bedfellows was the creation of the food stamp program, which was McGovern and Dole essentially getting together with a combination of agricultural issues as well as low-income poverty issues. The, the end result was the creation of food stamps, subsequently, you know, WIC, a whole variety of feeding programs. Uh, you could imagine that it could be described largely something that supported the farm community. Um, but it also had the extraordinary benefit of moving a whole generation of people out of hunger. Uh, and it's under debate again today as to what those programs should look like, what WIC should look like, how should they be structured, are they doing the right things. So there are examples historically where an underserved group has partnered with a group who can help articulate a message, and sometimes that is the best method to use. My name is Yvette. I am currently a graduating master's student in the Department of Global Health and Population. And I have two brief questions for you. First, um, I'm very curious about, as someone who's interested in global health, and particularly US um, perspective on that, how, do, how is that something that we keep within dialogue today, mm -hmm. um, particularly when things are so bad here? Mm -hmm. um, secondly, I mean, you shared a lot with us about making decisions in the field, but I'm hoping you could share as well about the decisions you made to get to where you are in the field today. Um, with respect to global health issues, you raise a very important question, and it's true not only in health, but it's true generally. Uh, we are a nation that cares deeply um, and are enormously generous. Our attention span tends to be relatively short. Uh, we tend to respond very generously when there is a crisis that occurs. Um, you can think of Japan as the most recent, but you can think of Haiti, you can think of a variety of circumstances where we have committed funds. Uh, perhaps one of the most effective has been in the global AIDS activities, although, again, there are challenges today in terms of the funding, but the commitment to essentially invest uh, and engage. The, uh, but when it comes to sort of long-term commitments, it's harder to maintain. Uh, particularly at periods of time when there are challenges here in terms of spending. Uh, in terms of taking from those experiences examples that might help us think about the way we deliver health services in this country, we have tended to avoid being compared to England or to Canada. I mean, the, the, the poor member that sort of says, you know, think of poor Don Berwick in the course of, um, you know, commenting on, uh, positively on some of the discussions that occurred um, with NICE uh, in England was, you know, roundly criticized for using that as an example. So there is this reluctance to look outside the United States for examples uh, that we might use. 
but again, it is a question of attention. It is a question of priority. Uh, it is a question of establishing or finding a champion who's prepared to say that and be supportive of that uh, at odds with a whole variety of other things. Um, the, uh, it, this is a, an odd example, but um, there is a movie, the name of which I will now forget, um, Wilson's War, Charlie Wilson's War. War. Right. A very interesting example of a very specific set of circumstances. I mean, there are a lot of uh, interesting things about that movie and that story, but it was someone who, in this case, had a unique set of interests, got a champion, and then, against all odds, but at the end, what you saw was, oh, well, we've solved that problem. You know, let's move on. Um, and that is some of the reality of what we face, is how long we stay in uh, and how do we support it, given all the other demands in terms of resources. Uh, you know, Haiti is going to be a good example where we're a year out, uh, a year and a half out, still tremendous challenges in that country in terms of infrastructure, uh, global commitments, what's come through, how's it been managed, how's it been maintained. Uh, Japan is going to be, you know, again, in a situation where they're going to be dependent upon a, a great many people over a long period of time for infrastructure. And so the question is how we participate as part of the global community in those areas. And some areas have been more readily received than others. Um, in, in the case of myself, in terms of the decisions, <coughs> I'd like to tell you it was a well thought out plan. Um, it wasn't. It was um, a series of opportunities that arose. Uh, and a willingness to sort of take some risk. Um, uh, you know, I w someone suggested to me, Dole was looking for someone to handle health issues. Uh, I was living in New York at the time, headed home to California to graduate school. I was a Democrat, born and raised at, on the left side of the Democratic Party. Uh, <laughs> and did not know Bob Dole, didn't know who he was. Certainly never been to Kansas, flown over. Um, <laughs> And I interviewed with him, and in the course of the interview, he essentially said, I don't really care what your politics are. I don't care if you're a Democrat. What I care about is you've taken care of patients. I'm very interested in having someone to work with me on these issues who essentially has had actual patient care experience. I decided <coughs> it would be an interesting thing to do for a year. <coughs> um, and so the progression really occurred because of opportunities. Uh, Dole rose very quickly to become chairman of the Finance Committee, ranking and then chair of the Finance Committee, <coughs> and then essentially ran and was selected as leader and then served as leader for a whole series of, of years. And I chose because of my interest in the substance of what he was doing uh, and the issues at hand to stay. Um, and so it, it was really um, an engagement in the issues that kept me there and also just enormous respect for him as an individual and as a, uh, as a leader. Uh, but it was not a particularly well thought out strategy. Looking back on it, <coughs> I think the, um, the message, and I tell this to my students as well and to <coughs> interns that I had throughout the time that I spent on the, on the Senate. Side. I, I am a firm believer, one, in having students, having interns, being a mentor. I think it's enormously important and a responsibility. I also encourage them to think outside of the box. Don't necessarily just go to work for somebody for whom uh, you agree with on every single topic. <clears throat> that there is, there is experience to be gained in working for someone with whom you don't necessarily agree in how to present an issue, in how to argue a case, in how to present both sides of an issue, and learning how people think. And so expose yourself to things that are unusual, is my sense, uh, and take some risk. One more question. Uh, hi, <coughs> my name is Lana, and I'm a doctoral student at the School of Public Health in Biology. And uh, with that said, I have a specific mm -hmm. question for you, especially because you were in the Congress when the highest growth in funding for research, mm -hmm. especially health-related yeah. research, um, <coughs> was in effect. And mm -hmm. since that, the funding has been tampering off. And I guess I wanted to ask you, why do you think th that's true? Um, and what led to those decisions, uh, mm -hmm. such as are people not advocating as much? Because there are arguments made that the US is the leader in healthcare um, in some aspects because of the research investment and because of the discovery here. So. I just wanted to see your opinion and what is happening today um, in, uh, in the U.S. thought process, so, so to say, both in constituency and Congress to be 
um, not investing so much in research even with the growth of the budget. Thank you. Um, I think <clears throat> there are a variety of issues. One, there's the inevitable competing demands um, that arise at any point in time <coughs> in terms of other interests and other issues that arise. <coughs> Secondly, it is uh, it goes back to whether there is a champion and how effective the champion is. Uh, among the most um, uh, outspoken have tended to be the chairman of the Senate Appropriations and House Appropriations Committee. And you tend to see when you go out to NIH and other places their names on buildings. <coughs> and not surprisingly. It's not random. It's not, it's <laughs> not random. Uh, but essentially it's the identification of an individual, an individual in a position of authority, uh, who is able to essentially persuade his colleagues or her colleagues to essentially support a particular issue. Um, and you find that this is true not only in the research area, but in a variety of others, whether it's the coverage of hospice benefits or a variety of things in Medicare or, you know, any other sort of area of interest. So it is identifying a problem. It is building a coalition. Uh, it is having a spokesperson who's able to essentially build consensus with their colleagues to support this. It is a wily politician who's able to negotiate those things in the context of an appropriations bill um, at a time when essentially there was money to be spent. What you're seeing today uh, is a decline in discretionary spending. And so one of the battles over the appropriations process is a, is a smaller and smaller pot of money being distributed over a variety of activities. Uh, the entitlements, of course, are exactly that. Medicare spends what Medicare has to spend, the same with Medicaid, the same with Social Security. In the context of the NIH, all of its divisions, the NCI and all the others, those are all discretionary dollars. And so that battle takes place every year in negotiations over what the allocation of those dollars will be. Um, there is a pushback against um, very narrow, very s sort of targeted dollars <coughs> in the battles over appropriations. Uh, many universities have benefited from particular members who've been particularly articulate about the issues that occur in their states. There are fewer opportunities for that to occur today uh, because of the reforms that are taking place with respect to the allocation of, of resources. But probably the single biggest issue is that decline in discretionary funding as we move into this deficit period. Final comment, huh? Sheila? Uh, thank you. I'm hoping that somebody in this audience is sitting here years from now playing Sheila's role <laughs> because what's important from her experience is that she took from a background in health mm -hmm. in, into the world of politics and, and government decision making. And uh, something, when you deal with politics on a day-to-day -day basis, people get very, very cynical about this. But if you step back with uh, Sheila and my career, uh, the number of people covered, for instance, by Medicaid, uh, yeah. low income in our careers, increased. went from 8 million to 50 million. <coughs> uh, right. The U.S. had a tiny outpost in global health research when we started. We're one of the major actors worldwide. Uh, neighborhood health centers were one in Mississippi mm -hmm. and one in Boston, and you came by like museums and looked at them. Now <laughs> there are thousands of them. So mm -hmm. what's very important is on any given day, uh, and that, I think, is what drove mm -hmm. Sheila's career. You may lose some issue, but over a period of time, there's been a huge transformation. And it comes by actually being involved in the process and not walking away from it. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. Sheila is an incredible mm -hmm. model of things that actually got done when you look over time. But on any given day, I I'm sure she walked in and said, why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. uh, but <laughs> over the long term, it's been an incredible career and impact. And it's one that I would encourage people here not to give up on in terms of the potential. Sheila, thank you very, very much for You're joining welcome. us.